but there's a, a... Uh, Matthias. Oh yeah. Would you kindly uh, just start from the beginning? I just started the recording. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you wanna? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Let's do it again. So my name is Matthias Minar, and uh, I have done a project uh, regarding sentiment analysis. Uh, so first, let's delve into a bit of the background to why this uh, such a topic could be interesting. So please, next slide. Uh, yeah, so um, every day, uh, a huge amount of data is uh, uploaded to the internet. Uh, a lot of this data is text data. Uh, if you think about social media or ebooks and news, uh, this is all text data, which is uh, available for uh, analysis, more or less. Uh, the text data can be a bit uh, tricky to uh, work with. So now I'm going to talk about an approach in which you can uh, extract some interesting information from text data, namely sentiment analysis. Next slide, please. Uh, so what do you want to do? Uh, well, what is sentiment analysis and, and what, what's the goal? Well, you want to extract sentiments from a text, but what, what is the sentiment then? Well, uh, at least uh, in when, when uh, I researched it, uh, um, I came to the conclusion that there are many different sentiments. Uh, some analysis tools only use uh, positive or negative sentiments. So basically, you when you do sentiment analysis on a text, uh, you uh, get a positive or negative sentiment as the output. But there can be a lot of different sentiments. Uh, for example, other feelings like anxiety or anger or happiness and so on and so forth. Uh, or uh, different topics like money or power and stuff like that, which is more, more uh, yeah, topical. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna, the next slide is just a, a brief uh, input output sort of flow chart. So if you can please switch the slide. So this is just to, to make it really visual and really simple. So let's say you wanna analyze a random tweet. So what you do is that you take this random tweet, you do some sentiment processing on it, and out comes these categories correlated to this tweet. Uh, and now it doesn't have to be tweet, it can be any type of, of text. Uh, it can be a corpus of text, it can be, yeah, whatever type of text you want. So uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, there are probably a, a lot of different approaches to, to uh, doing sentiment analysis. Uh, I uh, discovered two approaches. Uh, one of them being machine learning and the other one being sentiment lexicons. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so when it comes to machine learning, it can give some pretty good results as you all, if, if you're familiar with, with uh, data science or not, maybe you've heard about AI and what it can do. And when it comes to the sentiment analysis, there's no different. It can yield some pretty impressive and, and uh, uh, accurate uh, results if it's a good model and if it's, if it's trained properly. But there are some, some issues with, with uh, uh, machine learning models. Uh, firstly, they're, they're, uh, a lot of the time, I'm, I'm, I don't want to generalize too much, but a lot of the time they're, they have a black box nature, which means that uh, what happens between the input and the output is pretty much unknown um, for the user of the model, uh, which is uh, in some cases, especially when it comes to something like extracting sentiments from a text, maybe you, you, would, you would want that. Um, or maybe you don't, but in any case, there's often low explainability correlated to, to machine learning models. And then uh, it needs uh, a lot of uh, computing power a lot of the time. If we're talking about a, a GPT-3 open AI type neural network, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to, to train such a network. Um, so yeah. Uh, and also there's the need for label data a lot of the time, which is something that I didn't write up in the slides, but yeah. So the other approach which I ended up using, which is uh, quite intuitive and, and simple, uh, it's sentiment lexicons. Um, and these are basically just, just lexicons where you have uh, uh, words in a language. This is a Swedish sentiment lexicon, which is shown here to the right. Uh, and then you just have a, a, a sentiment correlated to it. So this is uh, Språkbanken sentiment lexicon. Uh, and as you can see here, you have the, the words. For those of you who are not Swedish, uh, these are <laughs> different Swedish words. And then you have a positive or negative sentiment and then the strength of the sentiment. Uh, and this is, a, 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 this is from, as I mentioned, from Sprogbanken. And it only has positive or negative polarity correlated to the words. 
But the thing with sentiment lexicons is that they, they need to be compiled by someone who knows, uh, knows language. Uh, so we're talking about psychologists and linguists uh, and people like that who need to compile them. So, so they use pre-existing knowledge, you could say. Okay, so next slide, please. But this, this is uh, the, the good stuff. This is uh, LOOC, Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, which is a tool that uses a quite uh, comprehensive sentiment lexicon because uh, instead of just uh, positive or negative, there are 70 something categories. Um, and this is just, uh, again, one super simple example. We take one word and uh, abstain, and in, in Luke, that uh, word maps to uh, risk and drives. Um, so you can, uh, the, the, the approach is quite simple. You just uh, uh, crunch through uh, a bunch of uh, a text with this sentiment lexicon, and you can. Uh, start by counting uh, the occurrences of all the categories. Uh, yes. Um, and here is an example of, of what type of output you can generate with just a simple count. Um, uh, so here are uh, two companies, uh, or yeah, one company and its competitor. This is real data, but I can't show you what com the companies are because it's confidential data. Uh, but it's a company and its competitor. Uh, so here, here you can see uh, two uh, categories which I used uh, of, out of these 70 something categories. And it's drives and power uh, during the same, same time interval as you can see here. Uh, and and uh, as you can see for the competitor of the company, uh, these categories occur uh, a lot, a lot more uh, than for the company. And this is just the, the, the baseline analysis you can do with this the output you get from, from sentiment analysis. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, um, yeah, uh, if, if, if you want to know more about what, uh, what uh, type of uh, other analysis you can do with it, uh, me and Ralph can talk about that uh, where, during the question time later. Yeah, thank you. And I guess I should point out that all of this is done, uh, done live and it's scalably um, on, on oh, yeah. Delta Lake streams. So you can monitor uh, tweets as they're happening. I guess all the sentiments of yourself and your set of competitors uh, geographically if time's possible. Okay, hello everybody. I'm uh, Rafaelia and uh, together with my teammate Virginia, we're gonna talk about bivariate trend calculus and causal inference. But first, let's uh, give uh, a few definitions and the basic steps of the trend calculus algorithm. Uh, a trend is uh, defined as rising if it has higher highs and higher lows, and falling if it has lower highs and lower lows. We can quantify this definition by assigning the values of plus one for rising trends and minus one for falling trends. Here is an example of uh, what we mean with these higher highs and higher lows for rising trends and lower highs, lower lows for falling trends. So now we're gonna go through the basic steps of the trend calculus algorithm. First, we want to stream the data across a fixed window size. Then for each window, we identify the dated high and low. Next, we summarize each window as rising or falling. And the way we do it is by the order of occurrence of the low and the high values. Lastly, we compare the summary of the current window to the previous one. The next step is that we want uh, to assign a sign to, to each window. And uh, the way to do it is by using the trend calculus equation seen here. Here is an example of uh, the summary that we previously mentioned of the windows, where rising windows are illustrated with a color green and falling windows in red. Uh, looking at the trend calculus equation, one might notice that uh, the value of zero might uh, be as a result, but this is not a problem for the algorithm. And uh, the way around this is by introducing the following data structure. We find the first high and low, the high, the low, and then the second high and low. Then we use an additional summary by using the second high or low of the previous window and the first high or low of the current window. 
we use this new window as a regular window and we find the trend. Then we compare the current window with the new intermediate window. And lastly, we find the reversals as usual. So now we come to the definition of a reversal point, which is a point on the previous window where the trend values flip. Uh, the way to find the reversal point is by following these uh, two simple rules. If the, trends move, if the trend moves from plus one to minus one, which means from a rising trend to a falling trend, then the previous high is the reversal. For the other way around, the previous low is the reversal. So now the output of the trend calculus algorithm for one iteration is a new time series that includes just the reversal points. In other words, a time series of trend change points. The return time series can be used as an input to the algorithm iteratively in order to find reversals of high order, or in other words, to establish long-term trends. This uh, stacking of trend calculus provides an efficient solution on finding high order reversals. And this is because on each iteration performed, the data is being reduced until no points are available or the required number of points are summarized. So now we're going to go through our showcase, which is going to be gold downs in US dollars versus the Brent crude oil price. And it is a pair that of, is often considered as the main representative of the large commodity markets. Firstly, increasing oil prices can lead to inflation, according to the Economic Research Journal. And at the same time, gold has been the, the most effective safe haven in most countries and is usually seen as a hedge against inflation by investors. So the question that naturally rises is the following. Can a change in oil price be a predictor of a change in gold price? Over the long term, gold prices tend to move up and down in tandem with oil prices. And here we see an illustration when, where the two outputs of the trend calculus for their respective um, time series are plotted together. It's worth mentioning that we scaled the two time series uh, in order for them to be comparable. The question now is if pathogen will capture the effects that we observe here. I guess I should point out that pathogen is an algorithm developed by... No. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. And it okay. won some championship. Yeah. Right. So okay. now good. Virginia will take over okay. to explain that. Good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is pathogen? It's a, it's a pandemic in the world. <laughs> so the pathogen algorithm uh, uses the GraphX uh, library to find causal inference, inference between time-related events. The idea behind this algorithm uh, can be described with this simple example. Uh, the rooster crows immediately before the sun rises, so then the rooster causes the sun to rise. Uh, having isolated events, pathogen uh, converts them into a graph model to look into the causal links uh, between the events. It has uh, two main packages. The first one is called rooster. It takes as an input an RDD of time-related events. Then it observes the true causation signal on these events by generating random correlation over them, but at different times. And after that, each event will be linked to many others event to many other events with the specific weights values. The output of uh, the rooster will be a graph containing uh, the observed and normalized uh, correlation. The other package is called Sun. It, take, it takes as input the output of uh, the rooster, uh, and then it extracts the most probable causes and effects by returning a graph uh, containing two uh, measures, aggressiveness and sensitivity. Aggressiveness uh, captures how likely an event could explain downstream uh, effects, or in other words, if an event causes other events, and um, sensitivity captures how likely an event results from an up upstream event cause, or what is the same if an event is caused by other events. The output is a graph containing these two measures values. Uh, we want to connect trend calculus and pathogen, and we want to use pathogen to, to perform causal inference on uh, bivariate time series. 
So the output of uh, trend calculus, as mentioned before, is a time series of uh, reversal points. And the input of uh, pathogen is a set of events containing an ID, a start and a stop time, and an amplitude. An event, uh, in this case, is the occurrence of consecutive uh, reversal points uh, for a specific order. The um, ID of each event um, has uh, the following encoding. Here we can see an example. The first uh, digit corresponds to the reversal order. The second one corresponds to the, um, represents the time series the, the event belongs to. So it will be number one if the time series is the oil price, and then number two it is if it is the gold price. The third digit corresponds to the uh, trend behavior. It will be zero if it is a falling trend, and one if it is a rising trend. And the last one is the slope value of the event. Here we can see um, a few rows of the input of pathogen where we can see it has the concept ID, event start and event stop, and the amplitude, which measures the distances between events. Before running pathogen, we needed to know the optimal pair of reversal orders of the two time series. And we use the Kolmogorov Smirnov statistic, and we choose the one, uh, the pair with the smallest uh, value for the statistic. The optimal values found were seven for gold and six for oil. After running pathogen, this is the result found, a few rows of the result. And this information comes from a graph. So the first two rows are the, uh, in the IDs of the, um, the related vertices. The third one uh, indicates the normalized correlation. And the last two ones uh, represent the causality measures. So here we have uh, an example. Uh, we have event 7212, which uh, corresponds to gold price at reversal order uh, seven for a rising trend with uh, a slope value of two over 20. And uh, we, which precede uh, event 6117, which is uh, oil price at reversal order six, six for a rising uh, trend with the slope value of seven over 20. So this uh, seems to show that a modest rise in the gold price at reversal order seven precedes a medium rise in oil, in oil price at reversal order six. Here we can see another example. In this case, we have a event 7210 that precedes both events uh, mm, uh, for gold, for oil price, both of them, but one of them is for a huge uh, falling and the other one is for a huge rising. So here we can say that a small rise in the gold price of reversal order seven precedes a huge uh, fall or falling, uh, fall or rising in the oil price at reversal order six. And in this last example, we can see that uh, a tiny rise in oil price at reversal order six seems to precede a medium falling in gold price at reversal order seven. So this, um, this can suggest that uh, one should take into consideration other time series different from the oil to try to, to, try to explain the drop in, in gold price. Oh, here we have a table showing the result uh, ordered by descending values of the aggressiveness. So, uh, we can say that event 7210 is the, the more effective event. Oh, now, Rafaela continues the discussion. Okay, so a few points to summarize is that the trend calculus algorithm provides a powerful solution for identifying major trend change points. The implementation is not limited to financial time series, but rather can receive as input any time series. And pathogen seems to capture part of our intuition regarding the co-movement of gold and oil prices, but also suggests that other factors should be put under question since the causality values are small. To conclude, we believe that the combination of the two algorithms that have the distinguishing feature of being able to scale, to 
to scale to arbitrarily large data sets can be very beneficial for discovering causal inference among multivariate time series. Thank you. Is uh, Suprara here? So two of he's, the... he's coming, he's coming. Um, okay. He uh, didn't find the link, I sent it to him. Hopefully he'll be here any oh, second. By the way, is Johannes Graner here? Can you say hi, Johannes, if you're here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah. So we should have a big thumbs up for Johannes because uh, he and uh, 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 Albert uh, Nilsson, they worked for last two summers as interns uh, at Combiant Mix, and they actually built uh, all the Delta Lakes under the hood. Thank you very much. <laughs> Has helped me for sure. <laughs> I'm glad that they still work. <laughs> um, I could do the, the, the other presentation because uh, then we can go back to this. So um, also, uh, Muhammad Mustakim Rahman already started the next job, so he couldn't be here. He's working, and uh, Yasser is not uh, feeling well to travel. So I'm going to present uh, some exploratory data analysis they did, and uh, I should point out that we have uh, a representative from the Urban Lab here, um, Magdalena. Um, so she. Uh, is part of a group in Uppsala called the Urban Lab, and they have some very interesting questions of interest to Swedish society uh, regarding the formation of uh, various uh, no-go zones. What is the Swedish word? Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's called like vulnerable areas. Yeah, it's vulnerable areas in English. So the, the question is around the emergence of vulnerable areas, which are sort of correlated with uh, high crime events. And then there's a very interesting research question on how it affects the, the psychological and other well-beings of people in neighborhoods and so on. So they have quite a lot of economic data. And uh, their question to us was, can you somehow give us signals from mass media and social media so we can actually sense how the population is feeling and how the media is reporting of uh, reporting such events, right? So then we started looking into multilingual GDELT, which is our uh, version two. So what is GDELT? It's basically a, a, a very large uh, database. Uh, it comes uh, from the parent project called Google Jigsaw, and um, it essentially monitors uh, media from all around the world. It uh, print and URL and, and, and more. And then the multilingual GDELT essentially captures uh, data from um, um, uh, all over the world in multiple languages. So um, what we did was basically try to explore the, the Swedish GDELT with uh, none of us being Swedish speakers. So it's, it's an interesting experiment. Um, and we mainly wanted to look at the sort of cameo taxonomy uh, of, uh, of, of Sweden. So these are ways of encoding events and then compare between Sweden and Norway uh, and focus on shootings, uh, the event type shootings occurring. And uh, a little bit on, a, on, a, on you know, a note of caution. So this is uh, essentially what I tried to recollect from memory. So it's events in the entire world at your fingertips since 1979, uh, over 65 languages, and lots and lots of metadata of the actual data. Right, the actual source data. Yeah. Um, so it seems like an attractive source for researchers. So here is a high level view. So actor one um, 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 has an action on actor two and uh, a sentence such as this, President Reagan has threatened further action against the Soviet Union in, inter in an international television program being by satellites to more than 50 countries. Uh, essentially, President Reagan is actor one, and uh, Soviet Union is actor two, and the action is uh, one of uh, threatening. threatening. Okay. So what you see uh, on the right is uh, sort of uh, tables, truncated tables of the three main types of event of, of, of tables, metadata and GDELT. Uh, the first one is called GKG, or Global Knowledge Graph. 
Uh, it has dates, themes, uh, GCAM codes, and uh, uh, lots of details uh, on um, how various actors are uh, related to one another. And uh, it's a parsing of essentially the original uh, source article. And then these get mapped uh, on a daily basis into event IDs where uh, these uh, automated algorithms try to do their best to identify unique events from the, the structure, the, 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 the structural complexity of the GKG description itself. Um, and then finally, there is a mentions table that essentially uh, says how many times a particular event ID, unique global event ID is mentioned in, uh, in, in each source all over the world, right? Um, so uh, there is a lot of sentiment analysis, the sort of rule-based type mostly that uh, uh, Matthias talked about was already done in, in the metadata of, of GDELT. And um, the pipeline uses tools that we don't really know because it's some, some black box as far as I know. Uh, is that right, Andrew? Uh, if Andrew Morgan is here, he's the one that got us into GDELT. Yeah, there's um, just like the lexicon approach we saw in the earlier presentation, there is uh, like 2,300 lexicons and those sentiment measures come out um, as the GCAM block of um, numbers. So effectively there's word counting going on. Um, on there's a lexicon on fish, for example, anyone mentions tuna or herring, it would add to the score for fish. For example, so it's a it's a large collection of dimensions slash dictionaries um, of lexicons that are important to that theme. So in that sense, it's interpretable in a simple way. Um, so exactly, so it it, it does uh, this type of processing, and it's in the metadata. Uh, here is an explosion of uh, of um, the cameo uh, taxonomy for events. So it sort of has uh, three levels uh, represented by at most four digits. And these digits, uh, the, the, the first one or two will be the root, and then that will be sort of uh, descending further. So you can have investigate, fight, or engage in unconventional mass violence as three different branches of the root of, uh, of a particular taxonomy code. And you can see that fight could be occupy territory, impose blockades, violate ceasefire, or uh, so on and so forth. Engage in unconventional mass violence, engage in mass expulsion, mass killings, blah, blah, blah right? So chemical weapons versus, so it's simply a, 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 a tree. So uh, some experiments were performed on GDELT and uh, uh, it, just with the metadata uh, initially. So we used uh, Patty Spark and uh, Delta Lakes that uh, were built. Um, by Combion Mix to handle the massive amount of data in GDELT uh, 2.0, that's this version with a lot more details. And then we specifically, for the first time, slowly started exploring into the non-English documents, uh, particularly um, Swedish. And then we had data for the 2021 year. Events inside the country only were chosen because uh, all the events are geocoded and events that have negative Goldstein scale, which is a score that identifies the sort of, uh, um, you know, some kind of formulaic potential impact of the event on the stability uh, of a country. Uh, was it CIA that uh, used the Goldstein scale at some point? I don't know if Andrew knows this, but uh, some kind of connection to uh, CIA, I believe. And that's where they were studying news to inform uh, policy and the, the ideas behind the whole project came up. Oh, right. Yeah. So these were operations starting in probably South America and Africa, I suppose. So even Cameo Taxonomy in Sweden, uh, this is a tree map. So you have 2021 Swedish media. Uh, so the color represents the tone of the text in the article and uh, the popular events were, for example, investigate, fight, uh, disapprove. So it's simply... Uh, uh, a uh, way of uh, visualizing the, the the count in the in the cameo taxonomy tree, right? So it sort of gives a gives a, a interesting picture. So comparison between Sweden and Norway. Here is a sort of a time series that's just plotting a number of events uh, uh, on the Goldstein scale between the two countries. So in the Goldstein scale. Um, um, goes negative, uh, it means that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a bad 
say no. Um, so, uh, and then this is the actual number of events. And you can see, you know, there's of course correlation because there is a lot of global news reported. And of course there is a lot of local Scandinavian effects. So comparison between Sweden and Norway. So this is uh, stuff uh, Yasser and Mustakim did. So there are Databricks notebooks that we will uh, make available as part of the project uh, for all of these projects. So people can just jump in and play. Uh, they can plug into Delta Lakes or make their own. Then the comparison here is between Sweden and Norway as a geomap. So the bubble size represents the number of events, color represents cold clean scale. And then the cities here at most events in 2021, Stockholm, Tilbury, and, and Oslo. Uh, and then specifically for the urban lab, they wanted uh, some sort of uh, um, uh, shootings uh, in, in time series. So this is the number of mentions and the number of events uh, yeah, in, in July um, and October, for example. There were 240 events with 378 mentions and in October 205 events. Okay, and here's a shootings in Sweden, sort of a geomap. Uh, I guess there are geospatial researchers in the urban lab and also economists and so on. Um, so this is just uh, pure metadata. Indeed. Oh, that's the end. Good. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, so, the, you know, uh, one thing I want to point out with GDELT is if you sort of naively uh, use GDELT, it's dangerous. And if you have a sort of a view from like a minimax decision theoretic point of view, if one data point is wrong, the whole data set is wrong, then you cannot use it because there is bugs. There are errors uh, and you have to clean and filter it. Right. Because there, for example, Yasser found a really interesting bug. Uh, um, Andrew, you might appreciate it that two million, two million, two two billion deaths happened. Uh, for example, right? That's sort of impossible. So you should really. Uh, yeah. So we're going here. So product here. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me now? Oh yes, brilliant. Hello. Okay, yeah. sorry for that. Yeah, I should uh, I should give a big props to Suprarek because uh, he was ill and has been home and uh, is uh, is speaking with uh, mild fever, but he's yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. I really expect that I could join you guys in Stockholm, but <laughs> I really cannot. I'm so sorry for that. Yeah, actually, I have tested. And it's negative, but I'm not quite so sure about the antigen test that I've got. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let's get started. I am Supra Anka Watanawit. I'm working with Ras. And we are working on the project called Lock in Free. And, um, okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe I, maybe no, I you, can you share my screen. Because I have to manually control it, sorry. Okay, yes. And we start the project with a problem that the students have a problem called when they're locked in. And by the term when they're locked in, it just means that students or some data scientists are too much dependent on the tools or a platform from a specific vendor. And when they have decided to work on one specific vendor, they might find it hard to migrate things or switch to the other platform because there might be some functions and features that are native to just only one specific vendor. And there might be some illegal issues or some technical difficulties to uh, migrate or move to other vendor. Next slide, please. And at Uppsala University as well, we have a course called SCADA Malay or Scalable Data Science and Distributed Machine Learning. In this course, we have also built up everything, all the course contents on Databricks and on over AWS. So students have to build up all the projects and access course contents and run course contents just only on Databricks. They don't have any other choice but to work just only this platform. So in order to tackle this problem, next slide please. We try to build a uh, multi environment of the notebook platform. So we decided to 
automate the environment into two um, platform. The first one is local machine, and the other one is multi-cloud platform. For the local machine, we decided to use Docker, and for the multi-cloud platform, we decided to use Terraform to automate the environment up. Next slide, please. And next one, please. Okay, and on local machine, we just decided to use Docker container together with Docker Compose so that students can easily start up the container and run everything inside the container easily without have to manually install in everything by themselves. So in the Docker Compose, we list all the images of services that we need. For example, we have Lamastic slash HS base, which is just a Hadoop frameworks, including HDFS and Sparks. And we also have a Zeppelin, which is just a Zeppelin notebook, and we have Jupyter notebook and so on. So students can just install Docker and run a few commands in order to start this container and work on it. So next slide, please. And on the cloud platform, we take an IAC approach or infrastructure as code by using Terraform HashiCorp. And as the name suggests, infrastructure as code, we just define everything that we want in our infrastructure in our code. And we can define how many master nodes, slaves nodes, how they scale up, how they scale down, um, the network configuration, subnet, firewall policy, authentication method, and everything inside the code. And then um, we can just use a few commands to start up the, 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 the environment. And actually we have two separate sets of codes. We have a code to provision the environment on AWS, and we have the other set of codes to provision an environment on Google Cloud Platform. On AWS, um, sorry, okay. And on AWS, we mainly have Amazon EMR as our primary service. Amazon EMR is a service that allows us to define the, the application that we need, uh, specifically the Hadoop frameworks and the notebook that we want. And for the GCP, we also have the same thing that is called data proc. Data proc is just pretty much the same as Amazon EMR. We can define Hadoop and notebook and all the configuration related to the notebook environment that we need. And students so just install Terraform and just use one command, Terraform in it to start up this environment. And next slide, please. Okay. And in addition to the automation of the notebook environment, we have also decided to convert all the course contents originally in Databricks into a static contents, which are in the websites and ebook. And next slide, please. Okay, for the websites, we mainly need to use the Databricks CLI because we need to export the HT, uh, to export the Databrick notebook into HTML files. And after that, we want to host these files into GitHub pages so students can access these pages from GitHub. But on the GitHub pages, we mainly use .md files for web pages. So what we need to do is that after we export our Databrick notebook into HTML files, we need to make .md files that links to each HTML files, and then we host both md files and HTML files into GitHub pages. And in order to automate this thing, uh, we need to. Uh, we decided to use the Docker. In the Docker file, we have Docker, we have Databricks CLI, and we have Python, and students just. Uh, actually, the user who are the teachers just need to uh, start this container and then everything will be automated for them. They just need to define the notebook modules and everything and then it will automatically do everything for them. And next slide, please. And for the ebook, we also need to use the two things. The first thing that we need to use is Pinot 
Pino is the tools to convert the notebook format uh, uh, between like Jupyter Notebook, uh, Simply Notebook, and uh, Databricks Notebook, and also convert the notebook into MD source files as well. And what we are doing right here is that we use Haskell Pino in order to convert the DBC Notebook, Databricks Notebook, into the MD source files. And after that, we have the other container called Rust MD book. And in, for the MD book, we use it to build the book from the MD source file that we have got from the previous container. And then after that, when we have MD book, we put it up into the GitHub pages. And in order to automate this thing, we decided to use uh, Docker as well. We have two Docker file, one for Haskell Pino, and the other one is for Rust MD book. And in order to start this container, we also have a bash script to run these two containers. And for the Haskell Pino container, we run a command inside this container by getting uh, by using the bash file, bash scripts as well that convert the 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 databric files into MD book source file. And then for the Rust MD book, we also have another bash script to build up the book from the MD book source file. And when we got everything, we push it up on the GitHub pages. And next slide, please. Um, yes. Um, for all the static contents of the course contents that we have already built, like the book, the site, and it's also the databricks raw files, we decided to compile it all in the SCADAMLA course page so that students can access it and can see the course map and uh, just select the notebook in the format that they would like to access and they can study on it so conveniently. And actually this is what we have already done in this project, but uh, we will continue this things in the thesis as well. And the next aim is to build the auto grader that can uh, auto grade the notebook, uh, the assignments, the exam uh, of the students. And we plan to make it work on the set match kernel and also on the smart kernels. And if we have time, we will also create we have well, we we will build it to work on some other kernels as well, and we decide to integrate the autograder. We will integrate it to the uh, the 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 university uh, system. Uh, sorry, sis, the the university ma learning management system. Yeah. Uh, in the studium as well, and also integrated to local machine and on the on the on cloud as well. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Sir Prarak. I, I want to qualify very quickly that this project started uh, when I came to Sweden because I should say that uh, my interpretation of uh, uh, Uppsala University's regulations and policies on on examination processes actually mandated that I had to essentially do this babbling from Databricks to Zeppelin in order to auto-grade in infrastructure on-prem. So that's how the whole thing started. And, uh, and Pino, Pino is uh, actually gitlab.tilo Wicklun um, Pino. He it was uh, uh, helping me with the course um, along with uh, Dan Lilia, who actually uh, wrote those uh, those uh, Docker containers a while back that we've been updating, so it's kind of a kind of a long process. So the goal here is basically to try to uh, be able to do uh, essentially notebook and infrastructure agnostic uh, learning and uh, examination in any public cloud or on prem. And more specifically, uh, on each student's laptop in the future envisioned exams in a completely wireless free zone. So that's basically Uppsala University's policy. But then if you expect students to remember 2,800 pages of printed material in five hours to pass the exam, 
then it's only fair that they have local MD books that can be running on indexes on their own system. So it's kind of a very tight operation for a typical laptop a student uh, can bring or the typical computer that's available in the computer lab because the Uppsala University policy, as far as I understand, mandates that I cannot expect a student to own a laptop to be able to pass the course. So that's kind of the interesting point here. And I want to say that Skaramali is heavily funded from the beginning, even while I was in New Zealand by Databricks uh, at the time. Um, so now it's called Databricks University Alliance. So I'm very active there. So this is not, uh, this is not uh, a hack to break down Databricks' uh, uh, proprietary notebook uh, servers. I still use Databricks for projects in the course. Uh, because it provides a very, very time-saving, convenient environment for interactions and collaborations and stuff like that. So I think, um, yeah, I just want to, I just, I just want to point out that if, uh, yeah, anyone from Databricks is listening, you know, it's not my our plan to break the business model or anything. And anyway, you know, you, you, yeah, it's, um, it's, um, it's something else. It's being being able to do exams in in Sweden. <laughs> So thanks everyone. I, I think we should continue discussion for uh, the remaining time and maybe maybe keep the sort of more proprietary discussions that maybe uh, Matthias planned to do on uh, uh, you know at another time because um, it'll be great to hear 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 thoughts uh, um, from people. If you have any questions, uh, please. Feel free to ask them. I can ask my question regarding the sentiment analysis. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I heard that it's a rule based uh, sentiment analysis based on those uh, lexicon, but um, as we know, there there is satires and there is a negative or negativity. So, does the model or the, this data set can handle that? Like like there is some defined tone of uh, describing something. For example, Donald Trump. Nothing good with Donald Trump, even if he does good things. But do we have any any like methods of uh, handling this uh, kind of negativity, the bias, the negativity? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You mean like, um, like the today, process of, um, oh. today I'm not that unhappy because unhappy is a negative word. I'm not that unhappy. Is 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 it going to be a positive word or is it going to be negative? If it's a rule, um, well, uh, 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 Luke has um, like uh, 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 he has a bunch of words which I know are like uh, I I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not completely sure I understand the question but but uh, uh, when it comes to do you mean like if if you have a, a, a negation in front of words say I'm happy or I'm not happy uh, is is that what you mean like that, that there's I mean, a difference what, there what kind of handle satires so they they report in the oh world. right 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 uh, in a positive way. Um, uh, not with the tools I use, no. Uh, I suppose that if you, if you to like uh, uh, decipher satire and, and stuff and stuff like that, I suppose you need to, um, or at least I would uh, I would uh, uh, look at more advanced machine learning models for that who can like uh, uh, in a more intuitive way learn uh, learn how language works. Um, I mean, so Simon Lindgren is here, so I don't know if he has any thoughts on this. Um, um. Uh, well, I have thoughts, but I mean, it's uh, it's a well-known problem, I guess. I mean, uh, I don't think I can contribute any more other than, I mean, those models for sentiment analysis that are strictly like dictionary based, they, they have this problem, obviously. It's quite a blunt way to measure. Like if you say hate and you say it's it's wrong to hate, then the word hate would still bring up the negative sentiment of that. But uh, I've been using uh, Luke a bit, uh, same as Matthias is using, and also uh, in some occasion uh, a library called uh, the acronym Vader, uh, spelled the same 
way as Darth Vader, but it's a, it's an acronym, uh, which I know is a model that claims to combine dictionary, uh, the dictionary method with like NLP tools around it. So I think, the, of course, the goal then is to try to alleviate those sort, sorts of things. And as Matthias is saying, I mean, obviously, it's easier to address stuff with uh, uh, straightforward negations and stuff. Uh, it's easier to catch and to make it in a fairly sort of uh, safe or robust way, but with irony and uh, stuff like that, of course, yeah, I think I would respond the same thing as Matthias said, uh, at least in uh, in an ideal setting, I mean, machine learning uh, models that are sort of agnostic to to other to, to, to sort of the lexical meanings uh, would be the best way to catch that because they don't dis discriminate based on like if 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 something is uh, in a in a broader context that might be negative even in, though it includes positive words it would be coded as negative so i mean yeah uh, obviously as probably most of you know this is the the key challenge of sentiment analysis yeah. i mean i uh -huh. want to really emphasize one thing uh, it's all in the report so the reports are almost 15 page each uh in 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 the report what we so sentiment analysis from my point of view i just think of a mapping from some corpus of text to something else we could of course use GPT-3 plus. Uh, and, and I should also point out that in, in tweets that are highly retweeted, there could be news articles. And then one could, um, you know, we used Goose library that, uh, that uh, Andrew Morgan and Antoine Amen, they, from, from their book, we kind of fielded it. And the Goose library does, does scalable scraping of all the URLs of interest. So you could scrape the actual news articles and simply pump it through your GPT trained model, either tran transfer learned from English on a smaller Swedish corpus or directly on the Swedish corpus. And you can do a you know, few short learning if you, if, you, if you have the resources, right? But I mean, <laughs> Versilius, you need a lot of resources for that. So that's from my point of view, once the model is built, it's a plugin, right? But if you really want to go deep into the network of rabbit holes, I'm sure I can find something else there to gain, right? But yeah, of course, it's, it'll be a lot better. The will be better. But I, I want to also really point out that this is not like, a, we're just not putting graphs. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the other things we've been doing, we can't quite share here. So the idea is that these signals are used to surface certain, certain tweets of interest to an organization. And then uh, there are sort of uh, interactive tools that uh, the, the analyst can use to actually see what it says. And, and so it's it's not you know there is a human in the loop heavily it's just a sort of a assistance for that raz you know one thing that um antoine did rather than me he studied the use of emoticons and tweets um, where people are putting in their emotional content alongside phrases to try to build a sarcasm detection um no, i don't know that's cool. Oh, yeah. In fact, the Voss yeah. PhD students who took Scaramelli, uh, one of the groups uh, last uh, last year, did a massive global uh, analysis of a similar kind. It's in one of these. So if you go down the Scaramelli page, there is a really huge thing. We can convert to MD book. It's 22 Voss PhD student projects. One of them actually does something like this. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. So I, I want to qualify that we're not providing any solutions or anything. It's just. Uh, master students just before they go to do their thesis yeah. work. Just maybe I'll throw it out there. So this area of sentiment analysis in commercial settings, because I'm in commercial settings, an area that I see this used is people would get all of the annual corporate reports for all of the companies on earth and then scan them. And they'll use a special lexicon created by you know, actuaries and financial accountants and they'll search it for key words that indicate risk. And, and a word that I heard was litigation. So if you ever read the annual report for a company and the word litigation is anywhere in that report, it's highly negatively correlated with financial, like, you know, um, prospects for that company, right? Because <laughs> it's usually very expensive. <laughs> so there are specialist financial lexicons that have been created. Um, and those documents um, rarely, rarely have sarcasm. So it's a, it's an area where you know in commercial settings you, you can you can apply sentiment analysis quite um, profitably. That's a really great point. Sarcasm-free yeah. corpus. 
Um, but uh, when it comes to irony, I'd also argue like, uh, isn't it like sometimes kind of hard for, when, especially on social media, isn't it hard for people, humans as well, to decipher irony and sarcasm sometimes? There's like nine levels of sarcasm on social media these days. Like <laughs> how, like I, I sometimes I'm, I can have trouble finding it as well, you know? So it's really, um, that makes it extra difficult. <laughs> One one further point I'd just make is that um, when you use this word counting and then you kind of summarize all of the words in a corpus, um, yeah. if there's a lot of duplicate news, so a news story gets copied and pasted and retweeted and all this kind of stuff, you could actually be double counting a lot. So a key area for this is to deduplicate the text and the approach that Antoine and I um, presented at Databricks at a conference many years ago was to use SimHash, um, SimHash methods with Spark to deduplicate to just one, the primary news story. In other words, the breaking news story. Um, and then everyone else is copying that breaking news story. Um, and that way the sentiment measures that you then aggregate up are, um, are free of that double counting. Right, but the double counting, like uh, coping pasting news would almost act as a retweet in a sense. And that is also spread of the... Yes. It could also be useful, right? As a second yeah. signal to see like, the magnitude of who heard it. So yeah. it could be but a measure a of point. audience. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah I should point out that Mat Matthias uh, Inur is uh, doing a master's thesis with me and Simon Lindgren uh, on this uh, Swedish Royal Society grant we have on so called algorithms of resistance. And there we actually use no NLP at all. So uh, it's purely uh, the graph structures of tweets. I think uh, our time is up and uh, we have to st stop soon. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say, um, I really enjoyed the trend calculus um, presentation. I thought that you guys did a really great job with the oil and uh, gold analysis. I thought that was really interesting. And I'd love to know a bit more about your encoding, about those yes, teams. So I thought that was are. fantastic. They uh, worked really, really hard, good. Uh, I think, uh, harder than me. That's saying something. <laughs> so it's a great we piece really of work, yeah. tried to take apart and do a complete surgery uh, of what Antoine did in, in Pathogen and why it won the Big Data Championship. So we are kind of there, but we actually have made a complete Databricks notebook. Uh, we, will, we will push into, uh, into uh, the examples, you know, Pathogen examples of the Lamastex fork shortly. And there will be bugs, but we will all collectively fix it. That's the plan. There are many interpretation issues and timestamp issues we are trying to figure out. In fact, we have a long uh, discussion with uh, Albin Toft, uh, you know, the PhD student was funded uh, with Liam on scalable causal inference. Yeah. So we, 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 we will need your help, Andrew, for sure, uh, because I'm um, starting to teach a new course on Monday. And it'll be nice to bounce yeah. the notebooks back through you and Antoine, because I think Liam's goal is to try to algebraically and combinatorially formalize what's going on. And my goal is to generalize it. I think there's, and, and what I like about Pathogen is that it's completely scalable because it's just using graphics in a very clean way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I thought that you guys did a really great presentation. So that's the first thing. And the second thing I'd say is, it's very difficult to convey what the results mean without showing pictures. And, and great pictures always um, really sell a piece of work. So um, a way that we were considering to draw the output was to convert it into like some kind of fuzzy cognitive map where you have like the key event types drawn with lines to other key event types. And then you sign the, the, the edges with whether it's an increase or decrease and you can actually assign a number like a weight and those models, um, if you get into fuzzy cognitive mapping, you can actually run them forward. So you initialize them, you run them forward, and you can then um, understand, given where we are today with these um, injected weights, what, what the outcome might be in terms of, you know, the impact on various factors. And so it's kind of an expert system. And we were always hoping that we could um, initialize and pre-instantiate these cognitive fuzzy maps from the pathogen engine um or, and that's, uh, that sounds awesome um we're it's, it's of, a big piece of work though yeah it's a big piece of work but i'm, <laughs> but I'm interested but before that i really want to you know complete the yeah. surgery on pathogen of so course that would be great yeah and uh one more thing is uh they're they're starting the next job um, uh, 
on a completely okay. different domain. Or, um, so they, okay. they, they, they are going to leave. So we will push everything they have in the state it is best possible. And then, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I promise them good. I'll yeah. buy them buy them beer in the evening. So <laughs> they're in the color, so. Yeah, all the presentations were great. Guys, I have to drop off, but that was uh, terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we should drop off too, unless there are any burning questions or comments. Okay, thanks a lot for, uh, for coming in. Um, and I guess uh, everyone's okay with this being in, 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 in Google or on YouTube because it's all uh, academic and uh, yeah. that would be great continuity. Yeah. Cool. Ciao.